Um, what was your response to what we heard from the Attorney General of Kentucky today and the, the grand jury uh, in terms of the Breonna Taylor case? Well, I'm not surprised. I'm a realist. And so I, I, I deciphered all of his double speak and code talk. And we know that this is really a non indictment. It has nothing to do with Breonna Taylor. This was about Officer Brett Hankinson firing rounds into the next door neighbor's apartment. It had nothing to do with the murder of Breonna Taylor. Those officers, according to uh, the attorney general, were justified in that use of force. Now, I don't know how 16 shots fired by one is justified use of force when officers are taught to fire two shots in rapid succession and then reassess the threat. But nonetheless, that was his story and he's sticking to it. And I found it offensive that he would call out celebrities and alleged influencers because he too says he's a black man and somehow celebrities can't speak for uh, Kentuckians, but as a black man, he can speak for us. And so I understand he's skin folk, not kin folk. He doesn't speak for me. How do you... James Farr, live from Pasadena Media Studios. Get ready for more piercing and provocative. The Conversation Live starts now. And welcome to another episode of The Conversation Live. The Conversation Live focuses on social justice, restorative justice, inclusion, and equality. Coming up today, civil rights attorney John Burton is in the seat. We're going to have a critical and possibly uncomfortable conversation. John is the attorney who is representing the 21-year-old motorist, Christopher Ballou, who was viciously beaten by Pasadena police officers. He's also representing a member of the Anthony McLean family. If you recall, Anthony was gunned down by Pasadena police officers on August 15th. I want to talk with John get his reaction, see what the correlations are. Let's talk about some de-escalation, what went right, what went wrong. Let's go ahead and welcome John into the seat. John, how you doing? Hey, James, thanks for having me. Absolutely. Glad to be here. Absolutely, you know, we gotta con have to stop meeting like this um, and, and under these type of circumstances. But I wanted to first get your reaction on the uh, lack of indictment or the charges in the Brianna uh, Taylor case in, in, in Kentucky? Well, certainly not a surprise to those of us who are involved in this area of the law nationally. Prosecutions of police officers for excessive force and other kind of related civil rights violations while in the course and scope of their duties as police officers are extremely rare uh, and uh, arise only in, in very high profile cases like the Rodney King case being one example here. Mm -hmm. um, the, 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 they're, they're all on the same team, the prosecutors, the, a lot of the judges, the police, the police administrators. So it, 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 a prosecution for an act like this, even though the city settled it for $12 million, giving some kind of indication of the, the amount of wrongdoing. Mm -hmm. uh, let, me, let, let me ask you this, because it's been discussed in other media outlets and, and talking heads and pundits, but they've suggested that the uh, attorney general in, in Kentucky 
um, kind of crafted this this grand jury and, and this indictment in such a way that it wouldn't have yielded uh, more serious charges. I mean, is that how that process works? Yeah, I mean, this grand jury thing is 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 completely fraudulent because a grand jury is in no way an adversary proceeding and it's not a public proceeding. So a prosecutor can go to a grand jury and get a rubber stamp uh, on whatever decision is preordained. And that's clearly what happened here. We had the same thing quite spectacularly a few years ago in Ferguson, Missouri, over the the Michael Brown shooting, Mm -hmm. where it was just obviously a state result. And it's it's very cowardly. I mean, the system should work with uh, the officers being charged, given their rights, and having a, a a public trial with with real adversaries. But there's no there's no real adversary here, and then there's this sort of fraudulent uh, cover up. Okay. Well, Pasadena, uh, as you know, John, is not immune to uh, police use of force, and uh, you just happen to be representing. Uh, two clients uh, or the descendant of one of the clients and one actual client. And uh, so I want to take a look back uh, to a video that I produced. Um, This one is called False and Deceptive Statements. We'll take a look at it and and let's see what happened a little bit in the Christopher Ballou case. And I want to catch up, catch the audience up where that is. Let's go ahead and roll in this next clip, Jared. On November 9th, 2017, Pasadena police officers Larry Esparza and Zachary Lujan battered Christopher Ballou, punching him, striking him with a baton, and smashing his head on the pavement in an incident that allegedly began as a minor traffic stop for tinted windows. Despite the substantial use of force, all charges against Ballou were dropped. Most of this footage is from Lujan's dash cam and body cam. Footage from Esparza's body cam is unavailable. He did not turn it on until after Ballou was beaten. Were you guys chucks up? No, I didn't chuck up till like literally that. I couldn't have, I didn't have a chance to He like jumps out of the car. Officer Lujan's dash cam reveals Baloo already walking from his car as the officers arrive on the scene. This is only the beginning of a series of deceptive statements made by Esparza to excuse his actions. But it's particularly important because Pasadena Police Department's policy 450 requires officers to record all enforcement contacts and specifically instructs officers to consider initiating a recording prior to contacting or detaining people. Esparza was intending to contact Baloo, so he should have had plenty of time to click on the body camera before he even exited the vehicle. The Pasadena Police Department is strict in requiring officers to record all enforcement contacts. According to Policy 450, the only exception is when there is an imminent risk to the safety of the officer or others. And even then, the officer must activate the camera at the first available opportunity after the threat has been addressed. So, and welcome back, John. First of all, before we get into that 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 case and that situation, how's Christopher doing? You know, he's he's moved on uh, with his life. Uh, the broken leg has healed. There's, you know, obviously a little bit of residual. Uh, soreness, but you know he he's he's moved on. Okay, yeah, I know I know that must be you know tough at such a young young age to kind of have to experience that trauma and then the vicarious trauma that that goes on in in the community. Something that 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 stood out to me again in that situation was the uh, officer did not activate his body worn camera. Why is that like a critical part of this whole narrative and where we are right now? What struck me about this is as far as it gets out of the car and approaches Chris, and it, this is two taps to the chest. That's what it takes to activate the camera, what I just did. Mm-hmm. So there, there, there's no excuse other than he forgot and was just so caught up in the moment, which is what I expected to hear when I asked him about it. But instead of that, he blames Baloo for uh, actions like you heard on that that tape right afterwards, 
that because of what he was doing, that deprived uh, as far as the opportunity. And despite the fact that this was a very clear violation of a very explicit policy, the city of Pasadena has said in our case that the officers violated no policy, that there's been no policy violation, which is just how they exonerate police over everything. And it's, it's a very frustrating thing to deal with. But it's not if you think that they're not really adversaries. I mean, there are adversaries, but they're not adversaries to the officers that they're supposedly supervising. They're on the same team. And so, of course, they ratify their explanations, no matter how ridiculous. Where, where's the case at now? I mean, it's this, this happened way back in November of 2017. Where are we at now? We pushed the case very aggressively, and the city's lawyers uh, pulled out every stop imaginable, and they filed a motion to dismiss uh, that was uh, denied, and we got a very good ruling on that. Then they filed a motion for summary judgment saying we had no evidence to support excessive force claims and so forth. Kind of, kind of explain yeah. it in layman's terms, you know, we're, we're not lawyers. So what, what exactly does all of that mean? Because I know at one time the city had attorneys representing both the city and the officers. And well, that, okay. So explain that for us in, in layman terms, like that's sort of the everyday Joe can get it. Okay. So we filed a complaint where we spelled out our, facts that we think we could prove, which are basically derived from the, the video evidence, and then the legal theories such as excessive force and falsely arresting uh, Chris Ballou for assaulting the officers with a deadly weapon, when what's on video is the exact opposite of that, that he was a victim of an assault with a deadly weapon. Mm -hmm. So they then filed what's called a motion to dismiss, which is saying, well, even if everything we're saying is true, that still doesn't state a claim under the Civil Rights Act uh, for a violation of civil rights. And we had to brief that. And then the judge issued an order saying, no, you're wrong. Of course, this is a violation. Then we did all what's called discovery, where we took statements, depositions, and so forth, got ready for trial. And then they said, well, you don't have evidence that will support your claim, which of course we did, it's on video. So they filed what's called a motion for summary judgment to get the case tossed again. We filed an opposition to that, and that's under submission with the judge. Mm -hmm. Meantime, because the same lawyers were representing both Esparza and Lujan, the two officers, and the city that is supposedly investigating and disciplining them, we filed a motion to disqualify them as joint attorneys. And that's under uh, submission right now. Um, so we're waiting to hear from the judge on those two things. But on that second point, it's important for your audience to understand that this happened in November of, of 2017. Mm -hmm. And the police department knew about it right away. Uh, Cheryl Mil Miller is on the command staff. Moody. Uh, Cheryl, Cheryl Moody. Cheryl. Moody. Moody. I'm sorry. Moody. Cheryl Miller is the basketball player, right? Moody. Yeah. Cheryl Moody. Yeah. Sorry. Um, viewed it the next day. And uh, the chief at the time, Sanchez, was fully informed. And right away, they were backing the officers. But they still, to this day, have never conducted an investigation because as soon as there was an uproar and then we started the legal proceedings, they took the position that they could wait until the legal case had worked itself out before they looked at whether or not there was a policy violation. And in the meantime, these two officers have been drawing full salary and in fact, generous overtime. How, how, how do you suspect that they're drawing overtime if they're uh, on a desk right now? Because the numbers are uh, uh, available to us and were provided to us. Mm -hmm. Okay. I want, I want to switch gears a little bit because, you know, we'll get hard up on the time. I want to make sure that we are, we're able to cover everything. Um, 
you're also representing uh, the, the daughter of Anthony McClain. Uh, Mr. McClain was uh, shot uh, and killed on August 15th. I want to look at this, the, the OSI that the uh, police department put out, and then I want to get your reaction to it. What do you see and kind of where we are right now with that case? Jared, let's go ahead and roll in this next clip. I believe in. Do we take you turn off the car for me, though, please? Turn it off? Yeah, please. Thank you. Okay. All right, you step out there. We're going to have to talk on the uh, sidewalk, all right? Say step out? Yeah, please. I'm not stepping out. Well, you don't have a license, right? You haven't spent a license? So we're going to step out the car. Okay. We're talk on the sidewalk, all right? All right. So welcome, my partner. I'll get my mask. Oh, I'll come back and grab for you, all right? Appreciate the, uh, the concern, though. The adult male passenger was also asked to exit the vehicle. And... Moments after emerging from the vehicle, he began to run from the officers while making a furtive movement with his left hand to the area of his waistband. He ran between the Infinity and the police vehicle as he reached for the item in his waistband, while continuing to run in a southeasterly direction. The natural swinging movement of the individual's arms while running revealed what both officers immediately recognized as a firearm in his left hand. The officers gave chase and, after running only a few yards with the firearm in his hand in a raised position, the individual turned to his right and looked in the direction of the officers over his right shoulder. Fearing that the individual was turning to shoot at the officers, the officer closest to the individual discharged two rounds from his firearm. It was not immediately apparent if the fleeing individual had been struck by the gunfire, as he continued to run for a considerable distance. He eventually stopped running and fell onto the east side parkway of Raymond Avenue. While fleeing the officers, video evidence captured by a local surveillance system indicated that the individual had thrown his firearm across Raymond Avenue to the west side of the street. Furthermore, a witness provided a voluntary and recorded statement, confirming they were within close proximity at the time of this incident, and they saw the individual who was running from the police throw the firearm. The loaded firearm was recovered near the west curb of Raymond Avenue, adjacent to La Pinteresca Park. No other officers discharged their weapons during the incident, nor does it appear that the individual discharged any rounds from his firearm. The recovered weapon was not registered and had been assembled from different manufacturer parts with different serial numbers. The weapon was not legally assembled nor legally possessed under California's gun laws. As assisting officers responded, it became apparent that the individual had sustained at least one gunshot wound. Officers provided immediate medical attention and paramedics were immediately summoned. Paramedics arrived within five minutes of the shooting and more advanced medical treatment was provided. The paramedics began their transport of the individual to a local hospital just a few minutes later, where he died of his sustained injuries. The individual has been identified as 32-year-old Anthony McLean, a Pasadena resident. Mr. McLean had previously been convicted. And, and welcome back. John, so something that stands out again to me is the correlation between um, the Baloo incident, body-worn camera not being activated, and then this incident where the body worn camera isn't activated. Is this a training issue? I mean, what do you make of this? Well, if I could just correct something you said earlier, I represent his oldest son, son uh, not his daughter. Okay. It, it's fine. Um, because uh, if, to protect their privacy, we only use initials. Okay. So that, that wouldn't be obvious to people. Um, and, uh, well, obviously, there's a problem with, with officers activating their cameras. Um, and there's also a problem with disciplining officers who don't activate their cameras and, and uh, doing the necessary reviews to see whether the cameras are being activated. I'm sure it's a situation where 99 times out of 100, when a camera is activated, it turns out not to be necessary or useful for anything because nothing happens but then there are these situations. Although again, like in the blue case, since the partner did activate the camera and there's also a dash camera, I don't, I don't think we really lost any significant evidence as a result in either case. When, when you see this OSI of Mr. McClain, what do you see? I know it's early in the investigation. I know it's early in, in, in 
in terms of you filing cases, but you have filed a claim. So what what are you seeing in this? Well, I see a racially targeted stop, and the stop is exceeding what was necessary for uh, enforcing a missing front license plate and a problem with the driver's license. Um, while it was probably legal under existing law, uh, there was no reason for Anthony to have been asked to get out of the car. Once he was asked to get out of the car, he was actually not suspected of anything and could have just walked away or run away, which is, is what he did. I think whether he had a firearm or not is not particularly important in the case because a, a, a possession of a firearm does not authorize a shooting. It's, it's making a threat. And in this scenario, there is simply no evidence that, that Anthony McLean ever threatened anybody before, during, or after this incident. Well, I mean, so is earlier, you, you said just a little bit earlier that, you know, this was a racial stop. So do you have data to support that the police department is racially profiling? Um, I mean, the driver admitted that he was on a suspended license and that gave the police department probable cause. And I, my understanding is that Anthony was being detained. Can you can you speak to those three points real quick? Sure. Number one, we do have voluminous data that the only people who are pulled over in Northwest Pasadena and Altadena, where I live, for offenses like missing front license plates um, or tinted windows are black or Hispanic people. Uh, the evidence is overwhelming. We got 197 FI cards and 195 were, were black or Hispanic people when the city of Pasadena is majority white. So the racial targeting, yes, we do have that data. And number two, uh, there wasn't, it, 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 there, there has to be a reason to detain Anthony and being a passenger in a car that's being driven by an unlicensed driver or without a license plate is not a criminal activity. So there was no grounds to detain him. Uh, they were allowed to order him out of the car. Uh, but after that, he was free to leave. OK, so we're going to I want to talk about AB 392, um, you know, and get your opinion on if this was necessary. I know the old language was reasonable versus necessary, but I tried to get a comment uh, from the police department to show a video of them actually de-escalating the situation, but bureaucracy would not allow for that uh, body-worn camera footage to be released in another incident. But back last year, I did sit down and attended a, a shooting simulation. And I think what the uh, Lieutenant Grisafi adds can give some context to their position. Jared, let's roll this next clip in and we'll get John's reaction on the other side. Uh, what we've done is uh, we've provided uh, members of the media uh, with the series known as Policing 101. Uh, the purpose of Policing 101 is to um, share some of our law enforcement experiences that we have on a daily basis with members of the media in order to educate them and have, let them have a better understanding of uh, what we do as police officers. They need to understand that uh, uh, we are regulated by law and uh, and by ex explaining the laws to them, uh, to the media, that is, um, we allow them to have a better understanding of where the approach that we take when we, when we do our job. Today's uh, topic of discussion was use of force, de-escalation. Had several different discussions regarding um, the certain laws that are in effect or potentially going to be in effect, in effect in the near future regarding use of force. Um, we explained some of those those new laws. Uh, we talked about de-escalation. We talked about the uh, Pasadena Police Department's policies regarding use of force. And we also demonstrated a couple different varieties of force that we use. Uh, we demonstrated the use of the baton as well as the carotid hold. Our intent here is to allow the me members of the media to understand and be educated on how law enforcement works here in Pasadena. Uh, I wanted to learn um, a little bit more on the inside of what the police experience is. Um, we're looking at the um, possibility of AB uh, 392 being passed, which would require police to de-escalate. Um, 
Um, I think with the, I, I have no experience, and so um, I, I, I got to trust that a seasoned, experienced officer would be able to make that split-second decision. And when you're given that authority to take someone's life, that ultimate solution, that final solution, uh, there's no recoiling. There's no you know ready, fire, aim. You have to be sure that what you're doing is is the right thing. Welcome back, John. We got just about two minutes before we got to get out of here. Just wanted to, you know, get your reaction based on your understanding of AB 392, the Weber bill, uh, what you've seen in the officer uh, involved shooting. It, does it rise to being necessary? And do you think well, that he'll build, do you think a prosecution will come as a result of this? Well, no, I don't think a prosecution will come because that's a political action that would have to be taken by a district attorney's office that no matter who wins the coming election does not have the the will to do it and even if they do it they they don't have the will to present an effective prosecution like one of us would mm -hmm. uh, but it, was it a necessary shooting absolutely no way uh was it reasonable no under either standard it would fail because there's only one circumstance in which a police officer is allowed to use deadly force and take somebody's life, and that's to terminate an imminent threat of death or great bodily injury. And Anthony McLean never threatened these officers or anybody else before, during, or after the incident. So it's a it's a it's a bad shooting. Are you allowed to? Is there a law that prohibits police from shooting someone in the back? I, it's not that specific. Um, certainly shooting somebody in the back would be an indication that they were not posing a, an imminent threat to the officer who was a shooter. But I mean, whenever you, you come up with rules like that, it's easy to imagine a circumstance where where the person is, is actually aiming at somebody else and the officer shoots them in the back, which could be a good shooting. Mm -hmm. uh, also, these are dynamic situations where people move quickly and there's you know reaction time issues. But none of that plays into here. I mean, Anthony, uh, for better or for worse, just decided to take off and not deal with these officers and was shot in the back, whether they saw a gun or not. Uh, it was a bad shooting because there's clearly, without any doubt, and contrary to what Chief Perez said before he released the video, there's no indication of any threat to anyone. Okay. You I can't shoot somebody for possessing a gun. All right. We got to park it right there hard on the time. Jared's giving me the light. We got to get out of here. Uh, again, John, always I appreciate you taking time to sit down with me and, and talking about uh, what, what's happening in our community. Again, you're watching The Conversation Live. The Conversation Live focuses on social justice, restorative justice, inclusion, and equality. Until we have another opportunity to speak with you, as always, Agape.